This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And so I want to give a special thank you to Mark Lever, Juan San Miguel, and an anonymous donor, who all just made very generous contributions to the show via check or PayPal. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so now let's get to our show. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 448 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing Season 2 of the Star Wars TV show The Mandalorian on Disney+. And this will involve spoilers for all of Season 2, so just be aware of that. And I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got Erin Lindsay, making her 27th appearance on the show. She's the author of the Bloodbound series of epic fantasy novels and the Nicholas Lenoir series of paranormal detective novels, which she writes under the name E.L. Tetensor. The Silver Shooter, the latest novel in her Rose Gallagher series of historical mysteries, is out now. So, Aaron, welcome to the show. Happy New Year. <laughs> the next up, we've got Rajan Khanna, making his 17th appearance on the show. He's the author of the post-apocalyptic novels Falling Sky, Rising Tide, and Raining Fire, and his short fiction appears in magazines such as Analog, Lightspeed, and Beneath Ceaseless Skies. His articles have appeared on Tor.com and LitReactor.com. So, Raj, welcome to the show. Thanks. Excited to be back. And also joining us today is Matthew Kressel, also making his 17th appearance on the show. He's the author of the novel King of Shards, and his short story, The Last Novelist, or A Dead Lizard in the Yard, was nominated for the Nebula Award and was a finalist for the Yuji Foster Memorial Award. His new novel, Queen of Static, is available now on his Patreon page over at patreon.com slash Matt Kressel. So Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's good to be back. Okay, so Raj, you told us over email that you might rewatch season one. Did you get a chance to do that? I, I did not, unfortunately, but um, I'm still looking forward to doing that. It's not like I was just doing it for this. I, I'm I'm really excited to go back and rewatch the whole thing. Yeah. Have you, um, has any, because I, I sort of felt like people were a little hard on season one last time we spoke. Has anyone uh, come to their senses and realized it's actually better than they thought? <laughs> I got attacked on Twitter for some of my comments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's Star Wars for you. Yeah. Um. I still like season one. Uh, we'll get into it, but I think season two is a lot better. What did people on Twitter say? Uh, I, I don't remember the specifics. It was something about the details of the episode where they, they do the prison break. And uh, this is season one. And um, it was like basically that I was talking about how the uh, the X-Wings just come in and automatically blow up wherever the signal is coming from. And I'm like, that's kind of ridiculous. Like, they're not going to do any recon. They're just like, oh, we got the <laughs> signal. We might as well just blow this up. So, I mean, I should be careful saying this again. I might get attacked again. But, uh, yeah, I thought that was stupid. And someone's like, how dare you? And, like, was went on this rant. I, I blocked them. It was <laughs> – somebody was. It wasn't, it wasn't like a, you know, I disagree with your opinion. It was very, like, vitriolic. And, yeah. and did they call you a scruffy looking nerf herder? Yeah, yeah. And I remember too, there was some part of that discussion where, um, Dave, you'll recall when we did the tenant panel, I was talking about the sort of um, type of answer that's a bit, why did the chicken cross the road? And one of the things um, that Matt, you had raised that I had agreed with was, um, uh, the details are a little fuzzy, but something along the lines of, why is the prison ship traveling at subspace? Um, yeah. and, and somebody on Twitter was like, they specifically said it was traveling at subspace. I'm like, were you the kind of kid who, when dad says, because I said, so you found that a satisfying answer <laughs> because for me, not so much I like to dig deeper on those sorts of things. Anyway, just the usual kind of people feel very possessive about a property and get sort of, uh, upset on a visceral level if you don't love everything about it. Yeah, but so people, nobody like brought up anything that made you think you were wrong or change your mind or anything like that. I think it's very rare that on Twitter or any <laughs> social media, someone, someone actually convinces anyone of anything. I mean, people are just kind of yelling at each other. And then occasionally, at this point, if someone just starts yelling at me, I block them. But but no, 
my mind didn't change at least. <laughs> well, no, and particularly because Twitter being Twitter, one has the impression that um, a lot of times those types of comments are coming from people who didn't even hear the podcast. They're just replying to something they saw in the Wired article or whatever. Or even yeah. just the title. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. So, I mean, like, but, you know, I really enjoyed season one. Um, I, I think I had, I'm trying to remember, I think I had very minor criticisms. Like I, I thought it was a little silly. They were, there were like people fishing with like reed baskets when they have droids and spaceships and stuff like that. But, uh, overall I, I thought it was a great time. Um, so I was really looking forward to season two and, um, I wasn't sure if we were going to do an episode on it or not. I wasn't sure if there was a whole lot more to say about the Mandalorian, but it was getting really good, really good buzz from what I was hearing. So, so I wanted to check it out. Um, and so uh, how about everyone here? Did, uh, did everyone here like season two more than season one? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> so how about Aaron? I think you were the most critical of season one on our last panel. So kind of um, what were your, what was it like for you going into season two? Yeah, maybe. I think I often come across as more critical than I mean to simply because it would be a very short show if we just sat around and said, yeah, it was rad. Um, so I, you know, sometimes maybe nitpick more than I should. Uh, I liked season one. I didn't love season one because um, I loved certain episodes and really didn't like others. And so it sort of netted out at a solid three star run for me. Um, and I think that was my big criticism of season one was how uneven the writing was. Um, and I also felt that overall it lacked momentum. I think I said at the time, and if I didn't, I should have, that I I don't think that's so unusual in the first season of a show, um, that, that second point in particular, that it seems to lack momentum, like it, it doesn't it doesn't kind of have a clear destination. And even within that, you know, the structure of a show that's designed to be episodic and to have that sort of Western feel about, you know, each episode is a sort of a standalone adventure that may not have a, a lot of linkages to, to other episodes. Still that sense of driving towards something needs to be there, I think, or it, or it starts to feel a little bit wishy-washy. And I think that's really where season two, I mean, there was a lot of things I loved about season two. Um, but the thing for me that was the biggest improvement was the, the sense of momentum going forward that even, even where the episodes didn't fit as neatly into the broader story arc. That was okay because you still were aware that that broader story arc was out there and that we were going to reconnect with it at some point. So I, I do think that they corrected, for the most part, corrected a lot of the things. And they showed a lot more narrative patience, I thought, in this run than they did the last one. So some of the more dramatic moments felt genuinely dramatic because they had been leading up to them and building up to them and, you know, sort of earned them. Whereas I, I think they didn't really do that as well in the first season. Yeah. So how about Raj? What was it like for you going into season two? I mean, so I, I liked season one. I mean, I had criticisms as well, but I, I was very excited after seeing season one. And so I was really um, excited to check out season two. But of course, you never know. Sometimes, you know, a show that you really loved kind of falters um, in, in later seasons. So I was cautiously optimistic. But um, I think from the first episode, I was like, oh, it, it just felt like they had turned it up, you know, maybe even to 11 this season. <laughs> um, and I feel like the success of the first season gave them a lot more freedom to kind of push it in certain directions. I mean, I know Dave Filoni basically mined a lot of his past material to bring in some some elements into this series, which I think were exciting for a lot of people who know some of the um, other shows that, that have been on. Um, so I think, I, and I agree with, I, I, I agree with the idea that this season having an, a kind of overall season arc and like, you know, motivation from the beginning about what, you know, the Mandalorian himself and, and was trying to accomplish, I think gave it a, a much, give it more weight, I guess. And then adding in all these little exciting pieces from other Star Wars lore uh, I think then elevated it for me. And then also like, I thought the stories were actually good. So, so I think all those things came together and um, each week I would say I was more excited for the next episode thinking, Oh, they can't really, they can't really build on what kind of the height that they've hit. And then they kind of would. So, um, so yeah, I really enjoyed it. 
Well, yeah, and let's just explain if anyone doesn't know, Dave Filoni is, I think, the showrunner of the Star Wars animated series, um, Clone Wars and Rebels. And so, yeah, and which I haven't seen. Uh, I know, Raj, you have. So yep. maybe you can fill us in on some of that stuff as we go. But yeah, I, I'm certainly aware as the season went on that more and more stuff from those shows was popping up in the in the Mandalorian. Um, but yeah, so let's get into that in just a bit. But also, Matt, what was it like for you? Just kind of expectations, early impressions of season two? Um, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I think that they kind of got into their stride in season two. I think they un, they really started to understand what makes uh, Star Wars work so well. And I think it's just because they're playing with these archetypes and these myths and they're getting to like the raw basic form of it. You know, stranger comes to town or playing with these samurai myths, these Western myths. And it really works. And I, and I think that, um, as Aaron said, the storytelling also improves and the emotional moments are earned. But, you know, I think that uh, Star Wars works best when you balance some of the humor with some of the more serious stuff and then you put it side by side. I mean, you know, you have like the humor of, you know, baby Yoda eating um, sentient eggs <laughs> uh, with, you know, uh, Bill Barr's character, forget his character's name in the, in the series. Bill Burr. Bill Burr. Burr. Yeah. Sorry, Bill Burr. What was his character's name? Mandrick or something? Uh, anyway, so where he's talking, he's Migs, shoots, Migs Mayfield. Is that I mean, Migs Mayfield? Mayfield? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Migs Mayfield. So where he shoots the Imperial officer that basically, you know, committed genocide. And then, so like you have these really, really heavy moments and these really lighthearted moments juxtaposed and on top of these powerful myths um, so I, I don't know. I felt, I just felt like it, it really came together this season and I felt each, each episode was like watching a little movie. I mean, the budgets were huge, obviously, and it was just visually really beautiful and narratively I felt, I felt more comfortable. Like I didn't have as many cringy or roll my eyes moments that I did in the first season and, and yeah, and, and it, um, my wife and I, like, she wasn't as versed in the Star Wars lore uh, as I as I am, and so she's like, "I'd like to rewatch or watch all the Star Wars films." So we, we did a rewatch oh of all eleven films. All uh, of it, them. All of them. in in. in <laughs> I forgot. I forgot what order it was, but it, it wasn't like sequential. Well, it wasn't chronologically. Um. Yeah, but it it we watched all eleven of them, and and you could clearly see the the flaws and some of that stuff, but, but it, it was, it was fun. It was fun. We didn't, we didn't do rebels or, or clone wars. Yeah. yeah well, I, well, you mentioned the budget. I'd actually don't know what the budget of this was compared to season one, but it felt like they had taken it up for sure. I mean, um, mm -hmm. you know, in season one, the Mandalorian felt to me kind of like the scrappy little show that could. And uh, obviously it's been a big success. And so I, I, I sort of would assume that they put more money into it this season. Just stuff like the the crate dragon was just yeah. visually so amazing um, oh, yeah. for a TV show. Like I just I just couldn't believe how awesome it looked. Yeah, that crate dragon. I mean, the, w that first episode, I was like, "Holy cow! This budget is is huge." And just um, yeah, I mean, like you know, secondary tertiary characters are dying left and right, and you're like, "I don't care. This is cool." <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I mean, it was just kind of ridiculous, but it was just, it was just so visually um, appealing. And, and it, it actually got me over, like, I was kind of getting tired of Tatooine. I feel like there's so much story that happens in Tatooine. And I was like, I was like, oh, another Tatooine story, but it actually worked. I was like, oh, I'm seeing a side of Tatooine that we never really have seen before. Um, and that was cool. And I like that we went to the other, um, the, uh, the Moss Pelgo, like we saw another town, mm -hmm. which I thought was cool. And it was like very clearly playing with like the Western tropes. Um, yeah. Well, I'm sure Aaron was happy to see Timothy Oliphant return. Of course I was. And he returned as, you know, his character. <laughs> so, so that He's was... remarkably well-groomed for someone who's living on an outskirt. Which is, <laughs> it's such an amazing verticality to that hair, which I appreciated after last time I'd seen him with the shaved head. But I, I mean, I, I was excited about pretty much all the guest spots uh, this season, um, you know, 
Timmy is obviously my boy, but other than that, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm like a big fan of Rosario Dawson as well. And obviously Starbuck. Um, so, I mean, it was just, and, and Starbuck also, um, is very Starbuck in this, isn't she? Yeah. Right, not and Mike, I want to mention, <laughs> I want to mention Michael Bean too, while we're on. Oh yeah. The sort mm -hmm. of Guess science star. fiction casting. Um, yeah, I, did, I actually didn't, because like I said, I didn't watch the cartoons and everything, but I didn't actually know that the Timi Timothy Oliphant character actually originated in Chuck Wendig's novel Aftermath. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of interesting for me to find that out. Um, I guess who just said, who just said, uh, uh-huh there? Was that Matt? I only know this because I was um, reading a, or watching a review of, of that episode and they were like, oh, and this character appeared in, in Chuck Wendig's novel. So yeah. And I didn't, I didn't even recognize uh, Michael Bean at first. Someone's like, yeah, that was Michael Bean. I was like, oh man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Sorry, Michael, if you're listening. I'm sorry, <laughs> Michael. No, I, I, he's like, you know, one of my favorite actors. I just haven't seen him in a long time. So I didn't recognize him. No, he's absolutely one of my favorite actors. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, let me say about, because sort of my impression um, was th with this season was that the first, it's eight episodes altogether, and about the first four were pretty similar to season one, I thought. And then I thought in the second half, they really like cranked up the like fan service up to 11 in a way that like the sort of the fan in me just loved, you know, and I was just like, oh, Grand Admiral Thrawn, Dark Troopers, all this stuff, you know. But then at the same time, I was kind of like, I have sort of one of my things with Star Wars is I'm a little like, uh, what's the word? I just, uh, uh, I, I wish that it could move forward more than it has, you know, that I sure. feel like it keeps circling back to the same familiar things that everyone loves and, and has trouble establishing new characters that have the same, um, uh, same magic as the, as, you know, Han and Luke and Leia and so on. And so um, I guess let's start with that. Um, what did people think about sort of that, the fan service aspect of the season? Um, I'll just say that I, I loved it because it was like, it felt like it was directed straight to me of like the stuff that I wanted to see. But I do, I, I will say I do um, agree with you that I, I don't want to see Star Wars always like looking back on itself and using the same kind of characters and points and things to, to, to tell their stories. And so I am wary of that, that whole thing. I, I saw, I guess you're right in that it's a split kind of right down the middle, but the second half of the season in retrospect, I view as kind of like this, you know, series of backdoor pilots that they were setting up for spinoff shows. So like Ahsoka shows yep. up in one episode, yep. but then she's going to go off and have her own series. And then, you know, Boba Fett shows up in one episode. And then later on, we find out he's going to have his own series as well. And so I think they were kind of like launching, you know, showing like, hey, here's this character. Now you can go follow their their story elsewhere. And so I'm okay with it. It Well, I, I agree with what Matt said too, in that I don't think they were just in there for for fun. I think there was a little bit of, you know, thought put into why that character was there and what purpose they serve. But if they're going off to do their own thing and then, you know, the Mandalorian series itself kind of stays true to what it's supposed to be, then I think I'm okay with that. And and I wonder if they'll tone it down for the next season once they have other shows to help kind of carry that load. Um, but I, you know, I, I, couldn't help myself from getting a thrill. I mean, the first season when the dark saber showed up, I, you know, I think I mentioned, like I stood up and was like, Oh my God, you know, in my, <laughs> in my living room. And so then I knew, you know, I knew Ahsoka was going to be in it. Um, and so I was excited for that, but like, I didn't know, like I somehow watched the Boba Fett episode two days late because I watch it with my partner and she wasn't available because she was working long hours. And I just had one friend saying like, watch this as soon as possible. And I thought, oh God, something big is going to happen. And I managed to avoid any spoilers. And that, that episode like made me, you know, like in the midst of this past year and pandemic and everything, like it was actually like, this may sound sad for my life, but it was like one of the like most exciting moments I think that I can remember <laughs> happening. Um, yeah, that, I'll, sh I'll shut up there for now. I, yeah. I think you said it though, like... Uh, I, I completely agree with that. I, I, I enjoyed it, but I also had mixed feelings about it in the sense that to me, it was very obviously positioning for spinoff shows in, in a couple of cases. And I just do wish they would have spaced it out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I understand why that might not have been feasible, particularly in the case of Boba Fett, but I would have loved for them, going back to narrative patience, I would have loved for them to hold on to that grenade a little while longer, um, because I just think it would have been so much more satisfying. Um, that being said, it's hard not to get excited about it. It's hard not to get excited when you see the green lightsaber, you're like, maybe, maybe. And then you see the glove and you're <laughs> like, yes, <Yeah. laughs> it's, it's hard not to get excited. Um, but at the same time, I, I would sort of hope that going forward, not necessarily that there's less of it, but that they space it out a little bit more and, and give us more of a chance to sort of treasure each one as opposed to knowing that the very next episode is going to serve up another one. Yeah. Well, let me just say, if people don't know, so there are 15, if I'm counting correctly, Star Wars movies, trilogies, and or TV series and or TV movies in development. Um, I have this whole list here. I, it's like so long. I don't wait, even want to read the whole... N new, new stuff. Yeah. Maybe I will read. Maybe I'll, I will wait, read. Wait, you're not okay. including like the pr the existing... No, no. No, no. These 15? are things that have... Yeah. 15, yeah. So uh, rogue, a Rogue Squadron movie, Mandalorian Season 3, an Obi-Wan Kenobi series, uh, a Cassian Andor movie, uh, the Bad Batch animated series about clone troopers, Ahsoka, an Ahsoka series, a Rangers of the New Republic series, presumably starring Cara Dune, a Lando Calrissian show, uh, The Acolyte from one of the co-creators of Russian Doll, which is set 350 years before Phantom Menace, a droid story movie, the Book of Boba Fett series, and untitled projects from Taika Waititi, Ryan Johnson, Kevin Feige, and J.D. Dillard. So, yeah, so those are all happening bring me the and type so, yeah. of ytt product immediately yeah take my money that's a lot yeah, well, of, that's uh, a lot of stuff there i i i would totally watch a lando series uh is it going to be uh the same actor from solo yeah yeah i think so donald glover um yeah donald glover, yeah yeah because he's he was great he's awesome yeah it's actually interesting one of the things i heard was that um you know they cast uh rosario dawson as um ahsoka and that fans have been agitating for that for years. I think, you know, they've been like, you know, and so, so they, they really just, they're like, okay, fine. You know, cause I guess like, and I guess that's one of the things is that this approach to star Wars does really seem to be, let's just give the fans what they want. Um, which I think is, is really working for them. Um, I have s like somewhat mixed feelings about it. Um, it's hard for me to believe I'm going to want to watch 15 15 of these star wars things but um you know i guess like you know it can be a sort of like throw it against the wall and see what sticks kind of thing and i can watch like what what the consensus is or the top three or four or something but i mean i think they're i think they're doing a good job if you don't know all the references because you know in watching some of the like youtube reviews of the episodes they're like oh and this character showed up in rebels and this is this and you know i didn't I didn't know that, but it, it, I still enjoyed the story and I could still sense that they were part of a larger narrative. Um, like you, Dave, I don't think I'm going to be able to keep up with 15 different shows. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to keep up with that. I mean, um, you know, clearly they're doing like the Marvel DC thing and trying to do as many series as they can and see, seeing what sticks. Um, I, I'm okay with that. I mean, I, I think that there's a lot of room for storytelling um, in this universe, but having, you know, just watched the 11 canonical movies in, in like somewhat order, you see that they start to reuse the same stories over again, Ob the obvious ones like the Death Star, but like, you know, the, the, the struggle against the dark side and, and, um, you know, de destroying your, your master, things like that. It just keeps coming up and again. And, and it's, it's an interesting story. But if if it they keep using it over and over, you you kind of know what's going to happen after a while, and it's not there's no surprises. So I think that the with the Mandalorian, what they're doing is they're it's a it's going in a different direction. I mean, I hope it is right. So you know, there was some speculation I saw online. They're like, well, you know, Baby Yoda, Grogu, you know, he's too young to know good and evil. Like he eats sentient eggs, right? And he he eats uh, one of the spider creatures, which is clearly some kind of intelligence, maybe not sentient, but, um, so they're like, Oh, is, you know, is baby Yoda going to turn to the dark side? And I, I don't, you know, 
want to necessarily see that. I, I see that <laughs> they're, they're like, I, I just feel like that struggle is becoming cliche in the Star Wars world. And I, and I, and like, that's why it's, it's refreshing um, to have a new take on this, which like this, I love the relationship between, you know, the Mandalorian and, and Grogu, like just, even before he takes off his mask and looks like just when he he discovers his name Grogu and then he keeps saying it just to see to see him react and it was like these little tender moments and I'm like wow like like I'm really affected and I I don't think I was ever quite affected like that in any of the films um, and I thought that was just a service to to the writing and the, and the strength of of uh, of the character but I also really like uh, Mando's like quest to um kind of find out like i don't know if they're necessarily i mean they might be going this way where uh i mean raj you might know more about this than i do or aaron like if he's going to bring back mandalore and and then i like how you're finding all these pieces of his planet's history that aren't exactly the same you know like one of the criticisms of star wars is like every planet has a unit culture, right? So it's like the water planet or the forest planet. But like every time we hear about Mandalore, we get a little bit different. Like, oh, you're the people who don't take their helmets off. They're the, what are they called? The, the, the death watch or the something. And, and so it's like, oh, that's a different, that's a different culture from, you know, Katie Sackhoff's uh, and then Boba Fett. And then, so we're getting like little pieces of, of the world. And so yeah. I, I basically I'm just saying that I think the world building is is great, uh, and I'm enjoying that it's veering away from that same old you know struggle with light and dark, which I think is still exciting, and they could still do interesting narratives with it. But I just I don't want to see that same story again and again and again. Yeah. So let me just a couple, respond quickly to a couple of those things. So in the um, synopsis for one of these shows, I think it was the Cassian Andor show, it said something like, it's about a plucky group who infiltrates Imperial bases and causes mischief or something like that. And I'm like, that's like every Star Wars movie. Like, <laughs> you know, do we need, I mean, and I think what's good about The Mandalorian is that it has its own identity where it's like a Western and that's what makes it different. And I think like all these other things are going to have to come up with some some angle to differentiate themselves from all the others. And I agree with you that um, the relationship of this, um, you know, ruthless uh, bounty hunter who has this like cute alien kid is the most successful um, character dynamic that they seem to have come up with since the original trilogy. And I think that's what people are really responding to. Um, but, um, okay. But how about Aaron? Uh, how do you, do you have any response to any of that? How about a show about a, uh a misunderstood imperial architect who is on a mission to introduce guardrails. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> because they need some fucking guardrails. Um, no, just when you were talking about the like invades imperial bases, I'm like, there's just going to be so many of these um, fights on the walkways. And I remember being really struck during that scene. Um, and I want to say maybe episode 15 or 16, maybe it's the rescue one. It's got to be the rescue one. It's got to be the last one where they're running around having these, um, these battles that look for all the world, like they're drawn straight out of the original trilogy um, with, you know, you've got the, the long hallway and at the end, the stormtroopers go trotting past and they're all chattering among themselves. And just the, the shots were all very familiar, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I think it would, it would be nice to see, some original stamps put on it. Um, that being said, I have to say I'm fairly skeptical that um, that that much content is going to provide a satisfying whole. I, I kind of just wish they would do more with less um, and and kind of build. You know, like I think they've sketched, they've got a, a pencil sketch, for example, of Mandalorian culture um, that it would be interesting to see more of. I'm sure they have plans for us to see more of it, but I do hope that, um, that it does become more nuanced and more complex. Um, there's not so far, there's not a lot of subtlety in the star Wars universe. And I've mentioned this well, before, and I want to well, see like, villains who aren't moths and Darths, for example. <laughs> well, like Matt was saying, I did think that was really interesting though, how they, they introduced this wrinkle that Mando 
you know, Din Djarin seems to be a member of some like fundamentalist offshoot yeah. of yeah. the Mandalorians. Yeah. Um, I thought that was, I mean, they didn't really do a lot with that in this season, but I thought that was a really, really interesting idea. Dave, can I just mention, so like, I, I just wanted to add in regard to the additional series. Like I, I, I get people's skepticism and I'm, I am skeptical, but of course love the fact that there's going to be a lot more content, you know, again, because it's one of my favorite, you know, it's, it's my top fandom. If, if I even have a group of fandoms, it's, it's basically my, my first and always fandom. But, um, I think the prop, I, I, I am skeptical. I, I, I don't think that they can make series and movies that just kind of explore other aspects of the world, like geographically. I think what they need to do is create series and, and movies that have different tones to them and, and maybe mm -hmm. explore different genres. And I've always, I've always wanted to see the world cracked open Again, not so much so that, oh, let's go see what was happening on Hoth before they settled, you know, <laughs> the base there or afterwards or whatever, but more like, you know, I want to see the, uh, you know, the the political intrigue Star Wars series. And, you know, I want to yeah. see, you know, the Star Wars equivalent of a Regency romance. And I want to see, you know, the the thriller kind of thing. And, and so- the Courtroom drama. <laughs> or yeah, or, or even that, you know, like whatever. The Nuremberg trials of the New <laughs> right. Republic. Because right. obviously the, a Western is an easy mapping because I think Lucas had Western and the DNA of it from the beginning and definitely the the, the samurai origins of that. Um, but I do think it can sustain, you know, like I'm hoping, for example, that this Boba Fett series that we get is going to be more like crime boss oriented, almost like, you know, elements of, of you know, mobs movies or something in the Star Wars yeah, universe. Yeah. And let's see that kind of side of things. And, you know, I, I really actually think that there is room for some kind of imperial show, um, you know, whatever the angle may be, because I think, you know, we, we talked about that Bill Burr episode, but like even just, I, there was so much drama potential there that, you, I wasn't expecting that. Like, I'd love to see more of that. And um, yeah. so, well, actually, you know. actually, let me pick up on that because yeah, that episode they they sort of infiltrate this imperial base and they end up having drinks with this um, imperial officer, and it was like straight out of um, Inglorious Bastards to me. It yeah, was like this total yes. like Quentin Tarantino thing, and I love that. I I, I totally one hundred percent agree with you, Raj, that they need different, you know, different genres and different tones. And as long as they're making everything else, the one I want to see is I had I didn't read it, but there was this Star Wars novel that came out a few years ago. I think it was called Death Troopers, but it was like basically a zombie virus breaks out on a Star Destroyer. Yeah. And I would love to I would love to see that. <laughs> I, mean, I think that the book got kind of mixed reviews, but if it was just like a squad of ordinary stormtroopers trying to survive on a Star Destroyer where everyone's being turned into zombies. That's the one I want to see. Yeah. The Skywalking Dead. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <Wow. laughs> um but yeah so i guess um maybe let's let's try to come back to mandalorian season two a little bit more specifically um yeah yeah so like overall i loved it um and like i said i had some mixed feelings about how fan service i felt it was getting but like totally in, in terms of my heartstrings it was it was totally getting me um i'm trying to think what other I guess the other criticisms I had was I, I felt like um, that Din Djarin in season one had started out as a ruthless bounty hunter. And by season two, he just seems like a fairly ordinary hero to me. I don't remember him ever doing anything dark, particularly, or being tempted to do anything dark. And I felt like that was a little bit of a loss um, to the show that I, I would have, I, I think, like, I felt like he should have been a little bit more uh morally ambiguous but um so I, i'd just be curious to hear what people think about that um so the the episode where you're talking about where they they um they have they basically go into that imperial base and and uh um you know mando takes off his helmet and they speak to the imperial officer um you know i, I saw someone point out online this is a very good point um the people who are attacking them are actually the good guys Right, because they're attacking the imperial shipment that is clearly invading their home planet and stealing their their resource. Yeah, the the pirate and kind of guys we're talking the about. The pirate guys, and yeah. then so like Mando kills him indiscriminately, and, and of course he's protecting Grogu. But 
there's also like you see them driving by these villages and the, the locals are basically uh, in the in the midst of this and, you know, getting, um, you know, killed just just by being close to that. So, I mean, it would have been interesting to see him contemplate like, oh, wow, I just, you know, whose side am I on? Right. Um, and they didn't ever really stop to do that. And just to pick up on that, uh, I had the same reaction and I even had that reaction um during the whole scene where they're where they're shooting down the stormtroopers um and you've got um what's his name migs basically migs is there and 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 previously we've had other characters in the movies who are starting to slowly humanize some of the stormtroopers they're not you know just robots in a mask they're people and some of them don't want to be there and the minute you start to do that and i like it to introduce that nuance and have people like Megs's character who are um, conflicted about the things that they've been forced to do in the name of the empire. The minute you start to do that, then you start to see all these stormtroopers running around as maybe something more than blank evil, in which case should not Migs at least, if not Mando and others feel somewhat conflicted about wiping them out wholesale. So, you know, how much do you want to get into that kind of that moral ambiguity? And it, it's not, it's not very Star Wars, or at least right. it's not very traditional Star Wars. But I think that's one of the things I appreciated. And I can hear people lighting their torches right now. They're sharpening their pitchforks. <laughs> one of the things I appreciated about that turn of, of Luke Skywalker, where he has, say what you will about that storyline um, leading into The Last Jedi, but it, it at least introduced some ambiguity about you know what what are you prepared to do for the greater good that that I appreciate it I like that sort of less binary way of looking at the world but but it does complicate those set pieces where everybody's blowing everything up and there are stormtroopers flying and sparks everywhere and the minute you start to see those people as as human or at least you know living breathing individuals and not just robots then it does become those scenes take on a darker hue Hmm. Yeah, I think I think it it's always shied away from that kind of grim dark. Uh, you know, Star Wars always tried to be like that popcorn fun thing and don't think don't think too much about about the million workers who were on the Death Star who was just, you know, that guy was just hired to be a plumber, you know. He <laughs> Yeah. Well, no, know, but that's a really about that in clerks, right? That's uh, a really good, that's a really good point and I mean it might have been interesting if um uh, Migs Mayfield had seen like somebody he knew that he among the stormtroopers or something like that. But I mean, that's actually, I think kind of separate from, do we think that, um, that, uh, the Mandalorian is kind of losing his distinctive character in this season and just becoming sort of a generic hero. I always felt that he, they, they were purposefully vague with him because that works for that sort of archetype, that myth making, um, you know, Clint Eastwood in The Unforgiven is a similar character. It's just like he has a mission, he goes to do it, and he's just very kind of, uh, you know, laconic, and he just has a mission. And you as the viewer fill in the gaps, and 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 it creates, in some sense, a deeper character in the viewer than if they were just to spell out every single one of his motivations and his thoughts. Um, I mean, I think, I think that like, yeah, I think in the beginning he's really blank. I mean, like he, he, yeah. his, his main mission seems to be, be a good bounty hunter. And if you get a chance to buy some Beskar, buy it and upgrade your armor, but that was it. And I think, I think in my mind, at least uh, this season, you know, as soon as he, as soon as he makes that connection between Grogu and, you know, being a foundling and, and what he has to do to kind of, you know, as part of the way um i think that becomes his new mission and so i do think he is a little bit ruthless i mean in the opening scene where he goes to try to find out information on mandalorians i mean in the end he's he's not like you know he he's still killing people pretty pretty ruthlessly um and when he goes to even meet with you know gorgeous timothy oliphant on tatooine i mean like <laughs> he he uh he also isn't like super friendly. He's not like, Hey, let's talk about it. He's basically like, give me the freaking armor now. Otherwise I'm going to shoot you. Right. Um, and then softens. Yeah. 
But I do agree that it, it, I wish it had played out a little bit more naturally and in stages, but I think with everything they were trying to do this season, they just didn't have room for that. Um, but, but yeah, I do also think, I agree with you, Matt, that, that they kind of have kept him sort of blank in that way. I also think that him meeting up with the other Mandalorians who are basically like, Oh, Oh, you're one of those, you know, where like he's walking around, like I am the epitome of the Mandalorian race and culture. And they're like, Oh, you're this like weird little cult offshoot that, that like came about afterwards. But you know, that's, they seem to have kind of come to some sort of, um, agreement that they need each other. And and I, I actually do think going back to an earlier question that the next season will be focused on going back to Mandalore, at least the idea of reclaiming Mandalore since he now has the dark saber and, you know, these, you know, that, that needs to be played out in, in a way that's yeah. satisfying. So now can I, can we talk about Luke Skywalker? Yeah. Yeah. I just, I'm really tired of the CGI, like the uncanny Valley, the CGI faces, like superimposed, like just get another actor, you know, like I, I don't, I don't need them to look exactly like they did in the film or I'm, I'm, my belief is going to be suspended, you know, unsuspended, like, you know, just be like, hi, I'm Luke Skywalker and have a, have a guy that looks similar to him. And I, and, you know, I think there were already some names mentioned. Um, why, why do we have to do this weird, like CGI that just looks so fake and cartoonish and, I don't know. It just, that ruined it. Not didn't ruin it, but it just, I was so invested in that when, when he came into the room and then I was like, Oh, they, they, they just painted his face over another act. (laughs) What did you guys think? Yeah, I completely agree with that. I mean, I've had a whole thing about um, how they should have handled these CGI characters like Tarkin and Leia in Rogue One. Uh, I guess if you go back to those episodes, I mean, basically I thought Tarkin should have been a hologram and Leia. They just should have, should have showed the door closing when the guy goes in and then her word hope should have just been a voiceover over the ship, like jumping to hyperspace. Um, This scene, they, they needed Luke to say a couple more things. So I thought that it would have been, if, if they were determined not to, I mean, I I thought they might not, because like all the fans apparently want them to cast Sebastian Stan who played, um, the Winter Soldier in the Marvel movies, who mm-hmm. looks, you know, fairly similar to young Mark Hamill. Um, but I, I can ima- I can imagine if they weren't sure of who they wanted to be Luke Skywalker going forward or something that they wouldn't want to cast, you know, a particular actor at this stage. Um, but I, I thought if they were going to go the CGI route, it should have just been focused on, you know, he comes in and it's all focused on everyone's reactions to him and their awe and you just hear his voice. And then maybe there'd just be like, when he says, may the force be with you, there's just like a quick shot of his face and then he leaves. Yeah. It's, um, I thought that, that that was the best way I could think of to handle it. Um, but, um, I don't know, Raj, what'd you think? No, I mean, I, I, I didn't, it was incredibly distracting, um, I think it's a hard thing to, I think your solution is probably one of the better ones. Cause you know, if they had recast it, there's going to be a huge part of the audience that's going to be up in arms or, you know, I, I agree also that, you know, they may not want to tie Luke Skywalker in this, in this intermediate place to a specific person at this point. But, um, and, and I mean, my hope to be honest, as, as much as it was a really cool moment, Um, and I will mention here that I love the fact that his entrance mirrors the entrance of Darth Vader, uh, in the doorway and the mist at the end of Rogue One, which is amazing. You know, red lightsaber, green lightsaber, perfect. Um, but I think that, uh, I hope we never see Luke again in the Mandalorian. And I hope that we don't really see Luke very much in any of the other stuff that they're putting together. Um, I mean, I assume they'll have to reference him because I assume Grogu will come back into the Mandalorian at some point in the future, but I'm happy if this was his one appearance and then it, and then that's it. So in which case it's more acceptable, but I will say I rewatched uh, rogue one recently because it was the only movie that I kind of felt like I could take. Cause I feel like it also has a tonally, it's a tonally similar to the Mandalorian in some ways. And it doesn't tie into the whole Skywalker saga, which I need a little bit of a break from, but um while when I saw it in the theater, I thought Tarkin was kind of cool and I didn't really mind Leia as much, even just in the years since it came out, I feel like that's already aging poorly and it will age worse in the future. So I also agree that they should use that you know, minimally if they can. I mean, unfortunately, this is five years after 
Return of the Jedi and everyone knows what Luke looked like in Return of the Jedi. I think once you go a little bit further out, it's easier to be like, oh, this actor's standing in. But again, I, I'm happy if we don't see Skywalker again for a while. Yeah, although let me just say, you know, um, I, I didn't like the CGI at all, but the scene overall I thought was amazing. Oh, yeah. and I was just totally had a strong emotional reaction to it. And even just like I was telling my girlfriend Steph about it just earlier, and I was like getting emotional, just like mm-hmm. giving a synopsis of that, of what happened, you know. So, um, you know, it really, really worked for me from a story standpoint. But um, but Aaron, what did you think of uh, Luke Skywalker? Um, I I loved seeing him there. I also hope that if I hope that's the last we see of him in this show. I think these things um, are treasures because they're ephemeral, uh, and the more you trot them out again, the more the luster comes off. Um, in terms of the CGI, I don't have strong feelings on it in general. I think the idea of making a movie with CGI James Dean is stupid. Uh, I think a scene here and there is not necessarily a bad idea. That being said, I didn't, I didn't think they did a very good job of it. And I suspect knowing nothing about this, this is pure conjecture. I suspect it's partly related at least to how much existing footage they have of the person at that time. I think if you have like a lot of frames to draw from, um, you know, like you got uh, just an example. I thought they did a great job of Michael Douglas um, in the Ant-Man um, because they had mm-hmm. a lot of Michael Douglas from that era to draw from, I suspect is the reason. Mm-hmm. Um, well, actually, let me say, cause I, um, I mean, I, I think it's noticeably bad. I mean, the CGI of Luke Skywalker in this, and yeah. there was just like, there's somebody on, on um, YouTube who just did a better version, you know, a better deep fake in a couple of days, you know, um, I saw one person suggest that, you know, to do deep fakes, you have to pay license fees for all the footage that you use. And so that's something that limits like professional um, productions that doesn't limit fans making stuff on the Internet. I don't know if that's true or not, but, um, you know, like, you know, fans on the Internet were able to do something 10 times better. But shouldn't Lucas or two. shouldn't Lucas film or, or Disney now, sorry, have, you know, tons of footage of Mark Hamill as as Skywalker, like that they own, right? Well, but he looks very different in all three films, right? Yeah. So, so I, I do wonder. Anyways, if if a fan has managed to do better, then then I can't really speak to that. But I do, I did wonder whether you know he, he particularly, obviously, looks different between, um, between A New Hope and The Empire Strikes Back. He looks quite different. So I think. Maybe that maybe that played into it. Anyway, I just think there should have been a moment, and I found that uneven as well in the last trilogy with with the Leia C- CGI. That some scenes worked better than others. Um, some facial expressions just don't happen. No smiling doesn't work. Yeah. Can't do it. Um, so if you are going to do that, then you should be a extremely circumspect about whether you do it at all, and b extremely circumspect about how you do it in terms of just recognizing the limitations of what facial expressions you can manage and what you can't, whether you have enough footage on hand to do a convincing job. And if you, you know, if, if, if what the program spits out ends up looking like what we got there, it's probably not worth it. Yeah. You know, uh, doing some uh, 3d art myself, uh, it's really, really hard to match the lighting. So like, even if they have like all this footage of, of Mark Hamill, um, if the lighting's off just by a little bit, it's just going to look fake. The shadows are going to be wrong. So they have to adjust for that as well. And then I, clearly they're superimposing it on another actor. And um, yeah, I mean, maybe they should have hired a better team or maybe there was some licensing limitations on it. But um, yeah, well, it, it's, also, that. It, it's also this is the last scene of the last episode in the season. And I wonder if they just, you know, like, you know, all this, there's like so many moving parts and like, you know, it just got down to the wire and this is what came in and it was too late at that point to like go back and redo everything or I, I don't know, but it, it's hard for me to believe that anyone looked at that and said like, oh yeah, this, this looks, this looks acceptable. This looks fine. Yeah. I mean, like you were saying, David, <laughs> like the, the, um, the crate dragon in the first episode was just amazing CGI. I mean, that thing looked enormous and that cave, I just, that it looked so real to me. And to go from that to to that, I don't know, that horror <laughs> of, of, but it's, of Luke. Yeah, it's still in so many nits to pick, though. I mean, really, yeah. it's it was still a great scene. It was a minor nit. It's a minor. Um, no, I, it, I loved it, it I, and it I loved that. Scene. 
Yeah, I loved, um, you know, they've established so well that, um, you know, the Beskar steel is impervious to most blasters, but then, you know, and then, of course, Mando's kick ass and he's very hard to defeat. And then along comes the, you know, the dark trooper and he's like literally pounding his head against the wall. And I was like, holy crap. Like that was the first time I was actually terrified. Um, Cause this was this monster. I mean, it was, it's a monster to me, the dark trooper. And then to see Luke come in and just like dispatch all of them was just, it was just really satisfying. Um, you were talking, someone was talking earlier about the, the sort of the cuteness factor of, um, of uh, Grogu's reaction when, when Mando takes his helmet off and all this kind of stuff. Two things to say on that. One, I really wish they hadn't made him take his helmet on off prior to that moment. It just mm, yeah. didn't have nearly the impact when he's basically at the bank teller and he has to take off his helmet, which I'm not sure why that works because what's the point of a facial scan if your face isn't in the database, but whatever. So he takes his helmet off. I really wish he hadn't done that because I think it would have been just so much there, there was already a lot of drama to that moment when he takes, he shows his face to the child for the first time. Um, but it would have been a heavier hitter had we not seen him do that only two episodes before that, or even one episode, I can't remember, it's two episodes before that. Um, yeah. But what I was going to say is that I had like a replica of that moment, um, the, the two episodes previous in my living room, because he takes off the helmet and my husband goes, wait, it's that guy? <laughs> I was like, okay, first of all, how do you not know his name? And secondly, how did you not know it was that guy? Like, we've been watching this for how long? And you've just clicked that it's Pedro Pascal under the helmet. I thought that was hilarious. I, I'm like, you're actually, adorable. Let me, let me say one, <laughs> one, one funny thing is that, um, you know, so my girlfriend's watching the show and she's like, I, I forget even how it came up, but she's just like, yeah, he's really hot, Mando. Like, not pedro pascal but just like man i'm like you don't even like it could be he could look like almost anything under the you know in that costume and she's like yeah but there's just something really sexy about that costume and i've just been thinking about that it's a lot true. like i think it's true the fact the voice that, plays a huge role too yeah but even i mean even leaving the voice aside it, there's just like something like sexy about the costume even though it obscures mm -hmm. pretty much everything about the person under which is one of the reasons i think you know like obviously the costumes are not exact but like boba fett you know, when I was growing up, like the minute I saw that, that, that costume on somebody, I was like, that guy's cool. Like it just was immediate. Yeah. And I think that's it's all about the costume where, where it's been built off of. And I, I just want to take a minute, if I may, to talk to wax about uh, Boba Fett, just because, you know, when I was growing up, everyone knew Boba Fett was cool. And then I think in the years since there's been this like, oh, Boba Fett doesn't really do anything. He just like, you know, accidentally like flies into the Sarlacc pit. And I think they're forgetting the fact that he was so smart that he was the only one who was able to track down Han Solo and deliver him to Jabba the Hutt in Empire Strikes Back. Obviously, not everything involves shooting blasters or, you know, whatever. But obviously, I felt that that was not a, uh, like a fitting end for, for this character that I knew clearly was this capable badass. And, um, you know, like in the expanded universe and all that, that, you know, they, they'd brought him back multiple times and basically like he's in armor and he just landed in this Sarlacc pit. Like how could he, you know, he could easily get out. Um, but the, so, so seeing him back was cool. Seeing him back and like capable of like this, you know, badass combat was even better with directed by Robert Rodriguez, that episode. Um, but also I think w when I was watching it, um, you know, there was a different guy in the suit who, who died recently and I'm blanking on his, uh, Jeremy Bullock. Right. So he was the guy who was in Boba Fett's armor. And then when they, um, when they did the prequels, he, you know, he's a clone of Django and Django was cast as Tamora Morrison, who's this amazing, uh, New Zealand actor. Um, but we never got to see Boba Fett kind of connected with Tamora Morrison either because, you know, even though they dubbed his voice in, you never saw his face. So not only did we see him come back, see him be a full badass, but then we got to see like this kind of rugged Tamora Morrison who's like amazing um in the in the actual suit. He's gone he's gone native on Tatooine. Yeah, and I, I just kind of just love that whole idea. And so I'm really excited and, and to see more about this character who, you know, again, we weren't given a lot of and I don't really 
need them to give me like a full backstory of, of Boba Fett. But I just, it, the little kid in me that fell in love with this character when I was, you know, I don't know, eight or something, or maybe even younger, six, I think. Um, and it, first appearance was actually the the holiday special and this little animated short that they did. But mm-hmm. um it it made me like Luke was great, and I had a lot of feelings about that. But Boba Fett was the one. As the minute actually Slave One like appears flying through the sky, I had some internal reaction that I can't even describe to you. It was like this weird, like you know, like something opened up inside of me, and I I just felt more whole as a human being. And I know that that sounds way over the top, but it was it was this visceral kind of like thrill that I. I the fact that this show can have moments like that to me is, is magical because it, you know, it, it's easy to say, Oh, you just show that ship flying through, but there was something about it that just was almost like, yes, that's a true moment for me. Um, connecting back to the stuff I watched when I was a kid. And, and, and like, honestly, I, I, I would be happy with just, if just that one episode had been good, but um hmm. anyway i'll shut up now do we do we sorry raj do we know how he got separated from his armor like so he goes into the you say he goes into the sarlacc pit and he survives because he's got this awesome armor well but then I, how does he end up without the armor i don't know if what their canon explanation is going to be but essentially in that first episode they drop this little line that the crate dragons actually i think feed on on the sarlacc basically yeah. so so i think maybe they're hinting at something where like he was in the Sarlacc pit, maybe like, uh, you know, the, the Sarlacc supposedly digests you slowly over many, many years that maybe a Crate dragon, you know, swallowed that up and he somehow escaped from that or who knows. But I, but I do. How does he, I that, still don't see how that gets him separated from his armor. Yeah, I don't know. Never made any sense, Ben. You would die yeah. of dehydration in 48 hours. Well, that's the other thing. Like you're never like, going to, right, exactly. <laughs> it never but made any sense. The the armor ended up apparently in some Jawa found it. So I'm wondering if like there was some kind of, I don't know, something happened and he managed to, maybe he took the armor off so he could wriggle out. Who who knows? I don't know. But yeah. Can um, I go back to something you said though? Um, and, and connect it with something Dave said. I, I think... I had a similar reaction. Um, I particularly loved the fact that they preserved the original 80s look of the Boba Fett armor, um, which I wasn't even cognizant of until he's standing beside the Mando version. And it's just, it's, it's got very 80s lines. I don't know what else to say, but it was just, it was so exciting to see Slave One, uh, which was one of my favorite toys as a kid. Uh-huh. But when they go into this spinoff show, I think one of the reasons it would be great to see it as a kind of Sopranos type situation is because Boba Fett has to be morally ambiguous. He has to be an anti-hero, or you can't really justify the decisions that he makes in Star Wars sure. in the original films. So it would be good if they avoided the temptation to turn him into too generic a hero or give him too much. I mean, I guess you could do you could do a redemption arc over time, and if it was a patient redemption arc. Um, that could be quite interesting, but it would be great if they, if they preserved that essential moral ambiguity that, and I, and I think that, that maybe in part, that's why Dave, maybe you saw it, um, in Mando in season one, because he is such a blank slate, it's easy to sort of project your kind of your own assumptions onto him. And I wonder how, to what degree our assumptions as viewers were influenced by, Boba Fett and what we, you know, sort of the moral spot that Boba Fett occupied in our, in our minds. Um, but just one last thing to say on the costume, because it is so amazing. Did anyone else notice that the, the females had a very like feminine looking version of the, of the armor, like not just in form fitting, but if you look at their masks, it's actually quite a, it's, it's quite a clever design, I think, because there's just something, yeah, there's just something quite feminine about the lines that they've used for the masks. Um, and of course, they have them in different colors, which is cool to see. Um, I really liked the costume design in this show overall, except that I just couldn't get on board with the with the fish lady. I wanted to. But that whole that whole storyline. Wait, wait! You didn't like you didn't like the fish lady <laughs> with the eggs? I didn't like the fish lady. Oh my god! She, they were she was awesome, and then and then she, she was like. He didn't know what the hell she was saying, but then she's smart enough to hook up the droid as a translator. I thought that was brilliant. 
Let me talk about the fish lady because uh, Matt mentioned earlier that that was comic relief when Grogu was eating the eggs. It's not I, really though. I I, I, I found had that a like really... almost impossible like to watch because yeah, it was yeah. so it was like because they also it was, it was horrible. They but set they, up they were to censor all her like potential offspring babies, and like it's the yeah. only ones that she has and like he's just like yummy. And she um, never seems to notice. This is no, this is my noticed. problem with the frog lady. It's like I, I, <laughs> I just I just didn't really understand the frog lady. Where is she coming from here? Because on the like in certain scenes she seems to be totally clueless. And then in other scenes, you know, yeah, exactly. She's figuring out how to get the, the droid to be a translator. It's just I just the, the frog lady it was like uh it was a great costume. Um, I guess to contradict myself a little bit, um, but I just yeah, that was the one episode for me that I was just like, Meh. I, I liked it because it it showed to me that there are people in the Star Wars universe that have nothing to do with any of the other shit that's going on in the rest of the galaxy. Like she just wants to get her eggs to her her man so he can fertilize them. Like that's what she wants. That's what she's and don't here we for. all really like when, right. Right <laughs> to, when it comes down to it, you know. Um, and, and I, and I enjoyed that and I enjoyed seeing somebody who was just not connected to the greater arc, but still had a definite goal and purpose and man, those spiders were creepy. They were. <laughs> Actually, let me, let me say about, um, also with the eating the eggs is cause there's a part where, you know, he catch, he keeps catching Grogu eating the eggs and he's like, don't eat that. Don't eat that. You know? And there's just something about Grogu because he has like the big eyes and the big ears and, and that that he reminds me so much of my cat who also has like big eyes and big ears. <laughs> and my cat is always like like going in the sink and like eating stuff she's not supposed to be eating. And we're like, Oryx, that's not kitty food. And then she's like, Rrr! and she like looks up and in exactly the same way that Grogu does. So I'm just wondering, like, does everyone think Grogu, does, does, does Grogu, does everyone think Grogu reminds them of their cat? Yes, or is that definitely. Just, just me? No, 100%. My cats are way too vicious to be Grogu, but I, <laughs> but I I do think like is maybe one way that you can kind of justify that scene to yourself that is less creepy is that the eggs aren't fertilized yet, so it's just like. I think that not, was part of how they yet. justified it. That it was like we eat unfertilized eggs, but like as my friend pointed out, yeah, but you know they're not this sentient. Is, this is right, or, or, or right, they're not like a, a human. Yeah, right, they're not the equivalent of a human in our own minds, well, I guess. But yeah. But I mean, to me, it wasn't even that it wasn't like, oh, he's eating the eggs and they're sentient. So they're suffering or anything like that. I was just like terrified he was going to eat them all and just like ruin this poor alien's life, you know. Yeah, and, that too. Uh, but even eating three kind of like screws up her future plans, right? Like, you know, he could have eaten the next Einstein, to be honest. So, <laughs> yeah, the next Luke Skywalker, even. Yeah, I mean, they established in season one, like Grogu. He just it found a frog and swallowed it. Yeah. Or maybe he just likes frogs. He just but, likes, yeah, amphibians. For a while, I was I was so horrified that in my mind, I was like, oh, wait a second. He's going to eat them all. And then something's going to, ha- or most of them, and it's, something's going to happen to the container. And then he's going to be like, oh, I didn't eat them. They were like, you know, gestating in my like inner, in my first <laughs> stomach or something. And he was going to regurgitate them all. And like, they were going to be fine. And that was not at all the case. So um, well, the way I saw it was like, you know, a lot of amphibians, you know, they'll lay like a bazillion eggs yeah. and only some of them will be fertilized. And that's fine because they accept that it's a part of like, yes, like only a few of them come. But that doesn't. Ex- ex- I mean, there's something in the Mandalorian about like, you know, there's these eggs and they're just like dumping them in this pool of water. You know, like he has he's like sworn to kind of take care of Grogu and yet he's constantly just putting him down in random places that are not safe. <laughs> so my and then, husband said yeah. he's like a terrible Stay babysitter. Yeah. And <laughs> and then, you know, like I I find it kind of funny too that, you know, he's walking around in this Beskar suit, which obviously is is helpful to him because I think it's a little too much that he can take blaster shots and, and lightsaber hits and like all this kind of stuff. But it is funny that it makes him a target for everyone because they're like, oh, my God, that guy's wearing like a million dollars on his body. Let's like capture him or kill him so that we can steal it. Um, and, and one of the things that's cool about that is that it enables the Beskar spear to be introduced into the equation. Because, I mean, I think we can all agree that hand to hand combat is more exciting to watch than, a, you know, generally speaking, than than a bunch of uh, blaster fire. And so the idea that but, you know, the 
one of the things that a lot of science fiction movies kind of leave you scratching your head is you've got people running around with these incredibly high tech weapons and then some asshole whips out a katana for no reason at all. <laughs> and you're like, why is this happening? They kind of square that circle with the Beskar spear. Yeah. Because it's actually an effective weapon regardless um, because it can deflect and, it, you know, it's it's impervious to whatever. So I like that. Yeah. 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 That's cool. absolutely. Actually, let me- I think somebody was just mentioning the spiders. I want to, that, that, and those reminds me of my other sort of complaint, which is a pretty minor complaint, but I feel like, and I did, because what makes me think of it is I did like the part where the, um, uh, the New Republic X Wings kind of show up on the scene or, and are like doing investigations and enforcing order and stuff like that. And I wish there was more of that because I feel like the setting to me, it's set right after, or it's set a few years after Return of the Jedi. But it doesn't feel that much different than if it were set, uh, you know, before the end of Return of the Jedi. Like the Imper- and, and th- this is my big issue with the Imperials that they all seem like they don't seem defeated and like they should be like the rebels. It seems to me like they're like order and discipline is breaking down and they don't have they're not being resupplied and they're you know, like uniforms are all like getting dirty and they're missing pieces and stuff like that and their ships are kind of like falling apart. Like they mentioned and at one point, they're fighting amongst this- themselves. Yeah, yeah. Well, they mentioned at one point that the this Imperial like cruiser, you know, usually has a crew complement of ten times what it currently has. But you don't like actually see that really in the show. It just everything mm-hmm. seems like all spick and span and imposing and everything. And I, I, that was my big thing that I would like to see is I would like to see more of the New Republic and more of the Empire feeling like like they're on the ropes and they're the rebels. Yeah, and just to build on that, if I could, I mean, if you wanted to sort of look at. Uh, real life as a guide, often what happens when you defeat an oppressive, all-controlling power, a regime, is that the the chaos that immediately ensues is in some ways worse for for a a period of time before before you come out of it. And you you can look at sort of the post-Arab spring as a really eloquent example of that. And what you tend to see in in, in what's left of the defeated force is that it fragments and starts fighting amongst itself or new warlords that come in to fill the power vacuum, all this kind of thing. Like there's lots of opportunity for villains who don't have capes and stormtroopers. And it would be nice to see more of that. Yeah. I, I just think back to the first season. I mean, one of the coolest things was when we see the stormtroopers for the first time and they're all like dented armor and dirty and grimy. And I, I, I agree. I didn't think about it at all when I was watching the season, but I would like to see a little bit more of that where it does seem like they're more bedraggled or, you know, maybe cobbling together stuff to help, you know, them do what they need to do. Yeah. Well, and that would be cool if there were, you know, yeah, different factions of the Empire fighting each other in Stormtrooper versus Stormtrooper fights and, you know, like Game of Thrones style, you know, betrayals amongst the remnants of the Empire and stuff like that. I, I agree with Aaron. That would be super cool. Um, all right, cool. So, um, those were all, does anyone else have any other, any other criticisms of just of the, of this season overall? I guess my, no. I, 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 my, I have two, the, like, two, they're very minor. Like it was the, it's the best car thing. Cause I do think there were some fights that he was in where it was just like, oh, he's not going to get hurt because, you know, and also stormtroopers can't shoot your joints, just the plates that are covering you know, the major parts of your body, I guess. Um, I, I, do, I, th- I wish that they had somehow been able to temper that a little bit. On the other hand, he's one dude sometimes facing 20 guys. So like, I, I don't know, maybe that, that was necessary. Um, and I, I, my only other criticism, and I, I will say, I love this season. I love this show. This is like, you know, a tiny percentage because you asked, but I felt like that whole idea, and and I'm basically agreeing with what Aaron said earlier, but that whole idea of him having to take his helmet off um, for that, that, you know, the Imperial ATM, like you said, w- was <laughs> felt so contrived and so unnecessary and i now agree that like it would have been better if that had been saved for that last episode so i i I think it was meant to tell us that oh he's now willing to compromise his beliefs if it's for the greater good but it felt like the script was just like this is a a place where this is going to happen and it didn't feel earned uh and it didn't actually pay off i think that well um Yeah. They wasted their trump card. That was their biggest, their biggest dramatic trump card of the whole first two seasons was was seeing what's under that mask, and they wasted it. 
Um, and, and that's absolutely what they were trying to do. And I think it served that purpose, but I just think that's not a good enough reason to get him to take the mask off. And they could have, they could have answered that call in another way. Yeah. Um, made that, made that point in another way without, without doing it. But I have a question that that's something you just, that, that something you just said reminded me of what the hell is the point of stormtrooper armor? As far as I can tell, right. it's totally useless. <laughs> yeah. Like it doesn't yeah. even protect them against punches, uh, punches, one like shot. Anything. Like why even, why even wear it? Just, it you know, have some great. guys in shorts they, come out. You they're know. ready to go scuba <laughs> diving or whatever, but I just, yeah, no, I don't get it's it. It's like one shot. They go down. I mean, yeah, it's, it, it's kind of a joke at this point, yeah. just how easy they, they fall. I do think it's a little much. It's gotten a little bit much. And I, I mean, I, I was happy so that when, you know, Boba Fett was fighting them with his stick or his staff or whatever, it was a gaffy stick or something, right? And and yeah, it, no, actually, no. you could see the armor shattering. And I'm like, okay, that I can appreciate. But I mean, the same thing happens in Return of the Jedi. I think Han Solo like punches a, a stormtrooper in the helmet which is like a hard protective covering and they go down and then never get up again. And I think to myself, like that is some really poor armor. How did these guys take over whole planets? And I agree with you, it's Matt. It's porcelain. It's just really, I, I, I agree that it's, it's now just kind of this accepted in joke that like stormtroopers can barely hit you and they go down really easily. But I, I think it's gone a little bit too far because, you know, then you, right. you also lose, uh, one threatening piece of your, you know, whole thing. I mean, I think I, I, I don't mind if they go down to like a, a blaster shot, but the, the, the physical kind of impact, I think lessens it. Yeah. And to, to go back to criticisms, I think my, my main, my main beef is still, uh, I just wish that I wish that our, our big bad wasn't a moth with a cape mm-hmm. and and I really I what I want is I I want to keep the chicken man <laughs> and but have him in a much subtler more interesting manipulative conniving I want to see the chicken man in space and I I just he he's such an amazing actor um he's so he's so subtle in his delivery Giancarlo Esposito like he's just his performance in Breaking Bad is just so stunning. And it, to me, when you, when you give him this really unsubtle role, you're not playing to his strengths. Um, and he does as well as, as anyone would do in that role. I think he's still, he's a chilling character. He's, he's a good villain, but he's, he's too much of a Darth Vader redux for me. Um, and that would be true regardless um, but I just think this is a waste of a tremendous acting talent when you could have just a much more complex layered villain um, in place of that. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I wasn't too, I, I didn't think the character was that, I mean, I was looking forward to seeing him in this role and I thought he felt sort of out of place. Like he didn't fit in the Star Wars universe when we finally met him. And I actually thought the the other Imperial guy, you know, who they were having drinks with, um, he, he I thought I was more impressed by him as a villain than um than moff gideon in in the finale um and yeah i I agree that he needs to be yeah he just seems like um uh you know like like dracula or something um from one of those old like hammer horror movies and i i think they need to find some way to make him more uh yeah more um intellectual or something i mean that's that was what i've always thought was interesting with um grand admiral thrawn um who was you know the he showed up in um uh, the first Star Wars novels. Um, yeah. I guess not, maybe not. Te- I think there was one like Splinter of the Mind's Eye that was before, maybe the novelization, I guess the novelizations were before, but, but, but basically the first thing that continued the story was Timothy Zahn's um, Heir to the Empire. And, you know, I've, I've met um, Tim Zahn I, and I've heard him say, you know, that he thought like, you know, we can't have another Darth Vader be the villain. And so he's like, so, so, so my villain is going to be, he's not going to have any force powers at all he's just his his like quote unquote superpower is just that he's really really cunning and um yeah and they they definitely tried to make moff gideon cunning but um i don't know it just felt a little it was a little it was a little underwhelming to me i think a lot of that has to do with that we're not really getting a lot of screen time with moff gideon and i think that's because they're you know playing it close to the chest with his whole you know what is he doing with Grogu's blood and and you know the weird cloning thing lab that they had they're they're not really showing you that side of it so we're not really getting into his head that much so to me he's coming off a little superficial 
Um, like you said, I, th- I feel as if it's a waste of a really good actor because I don't think there's a lot of depth to the character yet, but, but he's perhaps not, that's coming he's not in season dead. three. Yeah, exactly. Right. I, like maybe, maybe we can hope for more and the, and they can start from this fairly two dimensional villain that they've created and give us something a little bit better because I mean, yeah, the, the, the cunning aspect of it. And also, I mean, one of the things that I loved about the chicken man was this, I loved, he was just so icy, calm and perfect in those first couple of seasons. And then you see that he's just a hot mess of re- just repressed homicidal rage. And it was just awesome. <laughs> and I just, I kind of want to see those layers. But we do know his plot, don't we? I mean, he's, he, he's getting the Yoda blood to grow soldiers who are force users, basically, right? I mean, but that's a means to an end. No, but I'm saying that there's no, I don't think there's anything more to be revealed about that, is there? No, but I mean, we, we could learn more about the past. Like how, how did he get the dark saber and like, what did he do when he was on? I mean, I, I'm, I would be surprised if that doesn't come into play or they don't give us a flashback or a history lesson next season. If they do end up going back to Mandalore, since that will be part of it. So maybe there is further details about what he's doing, but I, I don't, I don't know how he learned about Grogu and, and And the whys of it. Like, okay, so he wants a a massive army of, of force equipped people, but is that so he can twist his mustache and be in charge? Or is that because he has a greater ethos that's driving him? You know, is, is he just, is he obsessed with order for order's sake? You know, like what's his jam? And there's, you could, you could build on that. I think, I don't think it's impossible to get away from a cackling, caped villain yeah no i i I don't know it it doesn't seem to me to fit really with this show but um the idea of a of a series of flashbacks where we find out how he rose through the ranks or whatever seems kind of i could see that like done in a breaking bad kind of style um seems interesting to me yeah yeah could be i i didn't love the way they handled the flashbacks in season one but (laughs) that's yeah no it's that um, I guess just one of the other things I wanted to mention is it seems like um that people have really responded so positively to this show when there's been so much of a you know like so much like acrimony and all this stuff over the um j j Abrams and Ryan Johnson sequels, and I just wonder if it's kind of like which you know like I liked um the last Jedi quite a bit as I've said um but um, I wonder if, uh, you know, part of, it seems to me that part of the, the reason that this show has been uh, so well received is because they had the Clone Wars and Rebels. And so a lot of these characters are familiar to fans already. And so it's kind of like, oh, yeah, when, when Ahsoka shows up, um, so a, a huge contingent of the fan base is like, oh, yeah, I, Ahsoka, I love that character. And I do wonder if, um, you know, just from a... <laughs> Uh, defensive standpoint going forward, if it makes sense to not introduce major new characters in live action and to kind of introduce them in animation first and build up a sort of fan constituency for them. And then when they show up in live action, there's, there's people rooting for them already. I Um, mean, I I think one of the reasons why for me, the, the um, Mandalorian works better than the, the last couple of movies is that they're taking their time. Right. So they're, they're just slowly building stuff. And I, I think I find this is a problem with a lot of blockbuster movies these days is where they just try to cram in everything. And then you have these only a couple seconds where you get to introduce the characters. And then, of course, you know, two thirds into the movie, one of them dies and you're supposed to feel this emotional connection to them. But it's like we only just met them, you know, 30, 40 minutes ago. And they had maybe one or two scenes and now they're dead. I'm not feeling it, you know, whereas when you have a a series that can take its time building characters, you can have more of an uh, emotional connection. Like, I I don't think that if Grogu showed up in a movie, you know, at the end of the movie, we would have such strong emotional attachment to him that we do, you know, in this in the case of, you know, 16 episodes of, of a series where you're developing the characters so I think I, I think that's part of it. I think it's also personally that that they're telling simple stories. I mean, some of these stories are like, I need this armor. Okay, well, if you, can you help me kill this crate dragon? And like, that's the plot, basically. Sure, there's yeah. sand people and whatever, but they don't, they're not trying to make overly complicated stories. Mm-hmm. And like each piece of the overarching story is a pretty simple, 
you know, and they're, again, they're, they're working with existing archetypes and, and, and tropes. And I think that that makes it, but then they make that version of it, I think, as cool as they possibly can. And I think that helps kind of make it uh, a kind of pure story without, you know, it, it, yeah, just, you know, something that's easy to digest. But David, I, I kind of will will disagree with you because I feel like, yeah, sure, Ahsoka buys them something. But if, if Dave Filoni isn't writing that episode, which he did, and somebody else did and they got it wrong that would have been a hugely divisive moment for the fans because there there are some young fans who are like extremely caught up in the you know the character of ahsoka there was even this big debate in the beginning about you know rosaria dawson versus the voice actress who played her and all this kind of stuff and so i think if they had bungled that you know or if you you know the reason a lot of people didn't like the last jedi was because they're like you brought luke skywalker a character that i love and you turned him into this you know uh grumbling recluse who disappeared from the world. And and that's not the Luke that I believe in. I mean, I, I really think that that was a huge part of why a lot of that's, people hated it. That's what so, I was going to say. Yeah. yeah, sorry. But but so I think the characters, sure, give you a bit of an entry in. But if like if they had brought Boba Fett in and he was still like a, a bumbling idiot, I think a lot of people would have been disappointed. Um, well, so I, I think there, it's it's like giving us tastes of these characters in the form that we recognize them. And I mean, Luke shows up and Luke does this badass stuff, but then Luke is still Luke. And I feel like that's the trick that they're pulling is basically, you know, giving us short, like intense, pure bursts of these characters without giving, like, Luke didn't have much else to do except show up and pick up Grogu. Ahsoka came in, she was kind of helpful and sort of Ahsoka-like, and then she left too. So I think it's more like that. No, no, but I'm I'm coming at it from the other angle of like I'm thinking of like you know because like in the Last Jedi there was this huge an- animosity toward the Rose Tico character, and I'm wondering if that character had been in like three seasons of the animated series before that movie had come out, would the character have had more support among fans, um, sort of like established already? Yeah, maybe. Um, I I think though t- to go back to what Matt said, I think they there were too many main characters too quickly in that. Um, whereas in the original trilogy, we got to spend some time with our nucleus of, of Han, Luke, Leia slash Chewie um, and build a relationship with those before you started folding in um, new characters. And I think we didn't get to spend as much time um, with our, with our core characters um, in, in the second trilogy, but to go, to go back to what Rajan was saying, I like, I think the animosity is primarily about using Canon characters in ways that people don't approve of. And I would say that the jury is still very much out. The Mandalorian has got great um, reception so far because uh, for a lot of reasons, but in, in, in this specific respect, they haven't stepped on any toes. They haven't stepped on any toes because where they've brought canon characters into it, it's been a snapshot. I think the mm. jury's still out. Let's see how the Ahsoka show does. Let's see how the Boba Fett show does when they start taking these, especially I think Boba Fett, because he's got such a long history, taking these canon characters and doing things that people didn't envision their beloved characters doing or or using them in some way that is not approved by some cohort of the fan base. Um, I think the jury's still very much out on, on, how, on how that will do. And I think the Mandalorian has avoided that problem by being minimalist in terms of its use of those characters well, and that lore. Well, right. And not just minimalist, but kind of like fan service right? It's like Ahsoka's here and she's bad, totally badass. You know, Boba Fett is here and he's totally badass. Luke's back and he's totally badass. So, you know, and it's like, yeah, it's not doing anything that artistic or challenging with the characters. Wait that, till the C-3PO episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, he's yeah. totally I, I, badass. <laughs> Yeah, C-3PO comes in and just is like wasting stormtroopers left and right. Yeah, no, I mean, actually, that, I would I mean, watch that would the shit out of that. I think <laughs> it would be awesome. But yeah, no, I totally, I totally agree with that. That yeah, like once the characters are doing something that's not just fan servicey, that's that would be the real test of how how they're being received. Yeah. Um. All right. Cool. So. Um, I don't know. We're pretty much out of time. Does anyone have any, just any other uh, subjects they want to bring up before we uh, start wrapping this up? I, I just want to say one short thing, which is that I have a friend who runs a special effects company and he 
said that the, they've been pioneering techniques on this show that are actually changing the future of special effects technology, mm. um, just in the same way that I guess the original trilogy did, uh, which I think is really kind of cool because they, they use, I guess, like digital, I, I don't really know all the details, but like digital backdrops and things like that and, and have kind of developed ways to, to get some of these epic shots that we're talking about without doing it kind of the way that they've always done it before. And I think it, it show, it, it, I mean, we've all said it, it looks kind of cool and, and movie like, um, and it's just cool to know that that's something that's coming out of this. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, cool. So why don't we start wrapping this up? So, um, Aaron, final thoughts on this whole experience of watching season two of the Mandalorian. Yeah, it's really encouraging. I mean, I think if if season three can build on season two as effectively as season two built on season one, uh, we're in for a hell of a ride. Yeah. Uh, Matt, final thoughts on season two? Uh, I love season two. Uh, it was a great uh, break from, from the horrible year. Uh, when, when the episodes were on, we just couldn't wait to watch them. Uh, I loved it. I'm excited for season three. Can't wait to see what, what happens with Grogu and all the others, but uh, yeah, it was a good season. Yeah, I guess I'm just a little nervous. I mean, because Grogu is going is is sort of exiting the show at least temporarily, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what makes the show work is that yeah, dynamic between. I think, I think Grogu's going to come back. I can't imagine them going on without Grogu for more than a couple episodes. Yeah, but th then there's also the issue if he comes back as a trained Jedi, is he going to be too powerful? And to... then is he going to start speaking? Yeah. Well, and they're going to have at some point to grapple with where Baby Yoda fits into the grand scheme because, you know, we know what happens many years down the line, right? Mm -hmm. And there's no Baby Yoda in sight. Mm -hmm. So how do they square that circle? I'm sure they've thought about this, but um, I can't, I personally don't think, a, a couple of things. One, I think that Baby Yoda, the idea, like they live to like, whatever, 900 something and change. Um, the idea, I guess, is that he ages extremely slowly, that he matures extremely slowly. So he's probably going to have to stay baby Yoda for the whole thing. So there, I mean, you know, however trained he is, he's still a baby at the end of the day, right? He's still a child. He will be baby Yoda in my heart forever. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine teenage Yoda, a teenage <laughs> like having a tantrum and like, no, I want to go out with my friends. <laughs> I'll eat as many frog eggs as I want. Yeah. <laughs> I'll use my force powers against you. Yeah. Uh, Raj, final thought. I loved it. I loved it so much. And, and there were so many moments that I just kind of got really legitimately excited for. I mean, I love, I always loved the whole Mandalorian concept and the armor and everything. So like now that we've gotten more of them, I mean, they basically stacked this show with Mandalorians this season. It's, it's been great. And uh, I mean, I'm so excited after just talking about it that I'm ready to jump back in and rewatch the whole series again immediately after this. So, um, so yeah, I, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, I mean, it's, it's super fun. Everyone watch it. I enjoyed the heck out of it. Again, really my only major misgiving is like, I wish Star Wars could find more ways to look forward rather than looking backward. And, you know, I hope that, you know, I think they, they did the looking backward thing really, really effectively in season two. And I hope they do a little bit more looking forward um, in season three. Um, but we'll see what happens. Um, but overall, really love the show. Um, all right, so let's wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with Aaron Lindsay, Rajan Khanna, and Matthew Kressel. So thanks, everyone, so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Aaron Lindsay, Rajan Khanna, and Matthew Kressel for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. 
If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.